Good evening, everyone. My name is Nora Walsh from the Princeton Public Library, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event, Writer Beware, with Richard C. White. We're very excited to be kicking off our Local Author Day 2022 with this presentation on the business side of writing, as Rich shares insights on identifying effective and ineffective editors, agents, publishers, and more. Local Author Day with a storytelling workshop on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. and our in-person author fair on Saturday afternoon at 2 p.m. in the library building. I am going to put the event schedule in the chat. We hope you will continue to join us this weekend for Local Author Day. And you can also find information on all of our participating authors on that website. Please note that this event is being recorded and it will be up on our um, library's YouTube channel in a few days. So if you have other writer friends in your network who you think would benefit from this session, please feel free to share that once it goes live. During the presentation, uh, we want this to be as interactive as possible. So we want you to please feel free to continue using the chat. Um, if you have questions, you can put them there in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, or um, you can also feel free to use the raise hand feature and uh, Rich will call on you as we go. So please, again, continue chatting and discussing as we go. We want this again to be interactive. So Writer Beware, as many of you may know, but some of you may not, is a blog and a website that discusses literary scams, schemes, and pitfalls, and provides advice and industry news for writers. It was founded in 1998, and it's sponsored by the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, or SFWA, with additional support from the Mystery Writers of America, the Horror Writers Association, and the American Society of Journalists and Authors. And our presenter tonight, Richard White, is a member of SFWA and serves on the Writer Beware Committee. He is an author whose works include novels and short stories, as well as nonfiction. As a media tie-in writer, he's also written for popular franchises like Star Trek, Doctor Who, and The Incredible Hulk. His forthcoming novel is a steampunk affair called On Wings of Steel. Rich, thank you so much for joining us, and I will turn things over to you now. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, if you guys will bear with me for just a second. I'm, I'm much more familiar with a couple of other pro programs than Zoom, so sharing the screen is always a bit of an adventure when I first get started. And that should be it there. And that did not, that was not it. Wait. All right, go back, White. What am I, what have I done now? All right, I seem to have lost. <laughs> we do see your presentation. Oh, you do see my presentation? Fantastic, we will go, we will just go from there. All right, again, uh, Technology, and I, I may work as a technical writer, but there's a reason I'm a technical writer, and that's because they don't actually trust me with technology. Um, again, I'm Richard White. I am a member of uh, the Writer Beware Committee for uh, Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. I've been a member since 2008, and this uh, slideshow I'm about to give you, which is somewhat sarcastically uh, titled How Not to Get Published, um, is a accumulation of things that I have observed, as well as uh, stuff from uh, the Writer Beware uh, records. As we all know, writing is an art, but publishing is a business. It's upon you to understand what you're getting into once you decide that you're going to become an author. Uh, you are a small business person. If you have a problem with a company, the authorities are going to treat it as a business to business relationship. So like things like the Consumer Protection Agency cannot help you. Better Business Bureau cannot help you. It is, uh, and a lot of uh, state government, you know, when you, if you like actually wind up trying to sue somebody, they're going to go, well, it's, a, you know, it's, you don't have the same level of protection because again, it's considered business to business. So it's on you to learn the business, how to find people who can give you good advice, 
because uh, we really don't want you just out there on your own flailing in the darkness. Uh, but the trouble is, like all authors, we love our stuff. We think we can't wait for people to read it. So the bad habit authors have is the first thing you do is you go into the Google and you type agent, and then you start sending off your queries to the first 10 agents that come up in Google. Unfortunately, we have found that honestly, a good chunk of the people you're going to see in, a, a, in that first are not good agents, but they've learned how to manipulate the Google rankings. Same thing with publishers. One of the absolute worst publishers had managed to manipulate the Google rankings so that they always came up first whenever you typed in Google publisher. And, you know, it, it, the thing is, we all sent, you know, like I said, and without doing the research, they just shoot their manuscripts off and they would get accepted. Why? Because this was not a good agent or not a good publisher. And they would generally regret the situation after the fact. So I'm going to try and help you all find ways to avoid that happening. Rich, I'm very sorry to interrupt you. We're seeing yes. just a part of your slide now. Uh-oh. Um, let me try, re let me try, I'm going to stop sharing and reshare and see if that works. Is that better? Yes, I believe so. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the question is, is if you want to be a trade published author, commercially published author, or nowadays they call it traditional publishing, or do you want to self-publish? If you want to go the traditional route, you're going to have to deal with agents who are the gatekeepers, publishers who are the producers of the material, and then the readers, which is your ultimate goal. If you're into self-publishing, you're going to have to do a whole another set of steps and we i've actually got the the last third of this uh talk is going to focus on self-pubbing but we're going to start off with agents i like to think of the agents as in two levels they're either desirable or they're not desirable if you're going uh you know especially if you're hoping to get published by, like with the big five or some of the larger university presses or something you probably will need to look into getting an agent. Uh, they are either established or new. There is, and, but the undesirables, amateur, an amateur or an incompetent agent. These are not necessarily evil people, just don't know what they're doing. Whereas the second ones here, the fee charging scammers are the ones you absolutely must avoid if you possibly can. Now, established agents. They're great because they sell their clients' books to advanced paying off you know, publishers. They have experience. They've either been in an agency or, you know, or come up through an agency, or there are a lot of times they are editors who used to work for New York companies or other companies and have decided they just don't want to deal with being an editor anymore, but they still like books and they still like working with authors, so they move over into being an agent. They should work strictly on commission. They should, I'm going to say that again. They should work strictly on commission. No upfront fees, no backdoor fees, no nothing. They don't get paid if they don't sell your book. They know editors and they know who are the right editors to put your specific style of book. If you're a sci-fi writer, they're going to find sci-fi editors. If you're a romance editor, writer they're going to make sure you get into romance you know editors the worst thing you can do is send like a romance to bain which specializes in military sci-fi or sending military sci-fi to harlequin it happens bad agents do that good agents know better because again there's no sense in risking their reputation by not sending your stuff to the right place and if you look at their websites not every good, not every legitimate agent has a website, but most do these days. There's still a few holdouts who, who don't mess with, you know, they're, they're about as good with technology as I am. But, you know, 
most agents will have a website and they will have their agent, they will have their clients and their clients' books posted dramatically right there up front because there is no such thing as a stealth agent. The agent's job is to get your name out in front of people. If an agent won't tell you who their clients are, that means they don't have any. Now, new agents, this is like the, the holy grail because if you can get a new agent who has just left an, uh, uh, a major agenting firm and is setting up their own uh, list, they may have taken three or four or five authors with them from the old company, but now they're looking to build their list. They may even be hiring some interim agents, you know, to work for them, some junior agents to work for them who are going to need to build their list. This is a great time to find an agent, but you will note these people have worked for other agents. They have connections. They're just looking to find their niche. You know, maybe they you know, don't want to do uh, hard boiled mysteries anymore. They'd rather focus on people who are doing cozy mysteries. Okay, that's fine. And again, they should work strictly on commission. Now we're starting to hit the undesirable because I, I, we call these amateur or incompetent agents. A lot of these people are frustrated authors. They've been trying to sell their books and they've been trying to sell their books and they aren't getting anywhere. And rather than look and say, wait, maybe it's just not the right story. Maybe I should go write something different. No, it's the system that's all screwed up. So I'm going to become an agent and I'm going to make sure that nobody else has to go through what I went through. And they wind up taking on clients. And, you know, tr because honestly, anybody who wants to can be an agent. I could declare myself an agent right now and be an agent. And I'm legit. It's not like a surgeon who has to go through you know, school or a real estate agent who has to go through training and pass classes or a lawyer who has to pass the bar. An agent is an agent because they say they're an agent. One of the stories we love to tell is a friend of mine set up a blog called Bad Agent Sydney. I highly recommend that you check it out sometime. Bad Agent Sydney was his kind of spoof on agents where he would take stories about bad experiences that he or his friends had had in his writing career and basically have Sydney, you know, writing about it as if, you know, Sydney was these people's agents. Sydney was his cat. Sydney was on the front page, a picture of the cat on the front page. Sydney used to get 20 to 30 manuscripts sent to her a month because people assumed either she really wasn't a cat, they were just goofing around, or B, they didn't do their research. They just saw, oh, it's an agent and sent their manuscript off. Stephen would try to write back to these people and explain to them that no, really, Sydney is a cat. She gets paid in tuna and you know she's not going to be able to represent your manuscripts. Again, these are people who aren't doing their research. They're just seeing the word agent and shooting off a manuscript. But, you know, so based on that, the trouble with an inexperienced or an amateur agent, they usually don't have any experience in the publishing industry outside of the fact that they're frustrated authors. They don't know many, if any, editors so they don't know what these editors like they don't know if they have a specific way they like to get the manuscripts they don't know if there's a specific genre that they would rather get than others they don't and again they don't network with other agents because the other agents don't know them they don't belong to any agenting groups um you know you're just they're just probably you know out there in the middle of nowhere you know trying to agent so they wind up sending, as I said before, they send manuscripts to inappropriate editors. The problem is with that is that if you've got an agent like this, you may have written a fantastic story. But if this agent has a reputation for sending stuff that none of these editors are interested in, those editors will probably just round file the submission without looking at it because they've been, you know, they've they've been burned so many times by this by this amateur agent 
So even though it might have been the right editor for your story, they'll never know because your agent has already poisoned the well before they, anything ever got sent in. Uh, agenting could be a sideline business. This might be something they do after they come home at night from their regular job. Um, and again, I'm not saying these are evil people. They probably became an agent with the best of intentions. The trouble is they really can't do anything for you. And while they may not necessarily take money from you, they will take time. And time is something we can't replace as an author. You know, you need, you know, so like we like to say here, agent is not an entry level position. Now, these people are evil. Um, I call them fee charging agents. Other people would call them scammers. Our lawyer has asked us not to call them scammers, but you know, uh, I will I will leave the interpretation up to you. Uh, people though, some of these uh, fee charging agents are people who like require a reading fee uh, with a submission. Uh, they may require a marketing, a submission, or an evaluation fee before they'll you know, accept you as a client. They may uh, offer to do a detailed critique of your manuscript for a fee. Uh, they may sell adjunct services like uh, they may have their own editing company. Now, here, uh, and here's where waters get murky, and, we're, and, and they're still waiting to get some feedback between like groups like CIFWA, the Authors Guild and stuff. Some agents actually do offer editing services. The ethical ones basically have it set up so that if they edit you, they will not represent you as an agent. If they represent you as an agent, they will not edit you. Now, and I say that all, almost all agents edit. They will go over it with you and make suggestions and comments, and they will advise, you know, hey, look, this could be better, yada, yada, because they're trying, they're trying to work with you to make it the best story it can be so that when they go to the editor, it is already mostly ready to go. But they, should, they will do that for free. That's part of their job. That's why they're earning their commission. If they're selling editing services, Either they can't, should not represent you as a client, or there's something very suspicious about that agent if they're selling editing services to you. Uh, other agents have been known to sell adjunct services like websites for $1,000. Um, they will be happy to uh, arrange publicity for you for money, except the fact that your book hasn't out there yet. So what good is publicity doing if you don't actually have a book to uh, show? Uh, they will offer to do mass you know, ma you know, mailings for you and they will offer to do this, that, and the other thing. But every one of those things is gonna have a price tag att attached to it. Uh, and I will say that some of the people that Writer Beware has gone after over the years live very well. Big motorboats, nice houses, trips to Europe every so often, and yet they haven't sold a single book any of their clients have. That tells you they're living off their clients' money. Uh, and that's just wrong, to be quite honest. They, their job is supposed to be selling you and your book, not making money off you. Uh, if an, if a, uh, publisher or if your agent recommends you to a vanity publishing company where you're going to have to pay to get your book printed you could have done that anyway i mean honestly you don't need an agent to go to a vanity press unfortunately we've also found many of these agents actually have either a kickback scheme with those vanity presses or they actually own the vanity press just under a different name so again you know, if money is going out of your pocketbook, there's something wrong with this situation. And again, also, you have to watch out for referrals to freelance editing. Oh, your book is almost ready, but it definitely could use some work. I know this editor would be happy to work with you. Sometimes it's just them under a different name. Sometimes it really is another editor, um, but who's getting a kickback? They're getting a kickback for it. Or 
you know, they may be like going out and hiring college kids to read your stuff. You know, they're paying them, you know, like five bucks an hour to go over your stuff. Maybe you get a good edit, maybe you don't, but you know, again, you're the one paying for it, not them. These are just not, these are things that show that the agent does not have your best interest at heart. Mark, here's some red flags I want to point out. Specialize in new authors. You'll see a lot of questionable agents saying this. Folks, every agent specializes in new authors. Stephen King's agent wants new authors. Why? Because one of these days, Steve, well, okay, I can't say that for Stephen because I don't know what kind of deals he's cut, but most authors will retire or die eventually. All agents need new blood coming in to keep their businesses going. Uh, but they should not specialize only in new authors because, again, they need some people in their agency who have a track record to keep the money coming in. Same reason publishers like big names and then they bring in the, the new people. But you got to have those big names because they help cover the new people until the new people become the big names. Uh, if an agent doesn't have any clients on their website, or if you see a bunch of anonymous testimonials, you know, so-and-so is the greatest agent I've ever worked with, signed Anthony B. No, no. That's the kind of stuff I see in the spam mail I get every day. Why would I want my agent doing that? You, you know, agents should be saying, you know, Tom Cohen is, you know, sold this book, you know, through, you know, St. Martin's Press, you know, and, you know, for a great deal. And, uh, you know, you should, and it should be verifiable. Last names, pictures, names of books, things that you can look up because you definitely need to do your research and find out who these people, who these agents rep, what kind of sales have they had? I mean, if you're, if your agent has six people and all of them have books that look like they uh, are selling in the three millions and they just came out this last month, that's a problem. Now, if they're selling in the three millions and the book has been out for 20 years, okay, that means, you know, it's, it's, you know, they're just basically just keeping it out there. But if it's selling in, if, if the sales are horrible, again, this is not an agent who's doing anything for you. Um, and if they won't talk about their sales or if they have no verifiable sales, if they won't tell you what publishers they work with, that, that's a big red flag because basically what they're saying is, I don't want you double checking on me because I have a reason. I don't want you double checking on me. Agents who approach authors, we call it trawling. Okay, if you have a blog that maybe has like 5 million hits a month, yeah, an agent might approach you about doing something. If you, as I like to say, if you land a plane in the Hudson because a duck flew into your engine, yes, I can almost guarantee you there were probably about 12 agents calling Captain Sully before he ever got off the wing of his plane. But you're not Captain Sully. You're not the captain of the Marisk Alabama, you know, you're not, well, okay, you, you might be, but I mean, because I, I don't know who falls on this call, but the odds are you, the average author is not going to have an agent chasing them. Why? Agents get anywhere from 40 to 300 submissions a month without asking. All you got to do is say you're an agent and people will start sending you manuscripts. If I'm getting all this sent to me already, why am I going out after people to, you know, to try and get more work? Again, if you're, if you're hot in the news right now, maybe they'll try and jump on that. But the average author, that's not going to happen. If someone's coming after you, if someone's approaching you on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram you know, or in the email or cold calling you uh, because you maybe like took it, maybe you registered your, you know, say you self pubbed and now you've got your Library of Congress, you know, in your ISBN. There are scammers out there who specifically troll the Library of Congress for any new copyrights so they can reach out to you and offer to help you out with your book. 
Um, non-standard commissions. Normal commissions are 15% or 20% foreign rights, because that means 10% for your author, 10% for the agent, like in Germany. If an agent offers to rep you for, 50, for 10%, they probably learned about agenting watching old movies, because it hasn't been 10% for about 20 years. And if, but I have also heard from people who agents wanted as much as 50% commission, which basically, which in all honesty, by the time they subtract everything out, you're pretty much working for free. So yeah, 15% is what you're looking for. Um, if you look at their website and their website is filled with typos and, you know, grammatical errors and honestly you're questioning whether english is their first language uh i would not want this person representing me because again they're supposed to be reading my stuff making recommendations writing the letter that's going to get my book picked up by a publisher and now we all make typos on twitter especially since twitter doesn't have an edit button uh and i'm not paying to have an edit button but you know, what's written in a, in, a, in a quick hurry and what I want on my website that's going to be there for everybody to look at uh, should be completely different things. And if my agent doesn't have a reasonable good grasp of the English language, I really don't want them representing an English language book. Also, if you are a poet, 90% of all poetry is self-published. Most poetry is sold to magazines. And then the poet builds up a repertoire. You know, they, they, they have their portfolio of all their published poems, and then they collect them up and sell them. A few people who have sold, who, who have gotten, you know, better known might be able to sell their poetry through a small press. And a few people, like maybe if you are the poet laureate of New Jersey, you might get an agent. But honestly, most poetry in America doesn't sell well enough that bigger publishers don't want to offer it. They don't usually offer in advance. Therefore, again, what is the agent making? The agent just simply can't make enough money selling poetry to represent poets. Again, it's nothing against poetry. It's just currently the economics in our publishing industry means that if an agent's representing poetry, it's because they either are not a good agent or just an, they're a very uninformed agent. And again, that's not the kind of person I want representing me. Now I've been harping on fees. I'm telling you all folks, they should work on commission. Why? Because if you have paid them, they've made their money. Why are they worried about you? You, they could care less if you've made money as long as the money keeps as long as that because some of these agents like want a $50 retainer every month they're making and so if they get a couple of hundred people that they're quote unquote representing at 50 bucks a month they are living well again they don't need to do any work there's we actually had one agency down in Texas that we um, they actually wound up going to jail. Um, when they finally busted them, the police found enough manuscripts they had not submitted to fill an entire jail cell from floor to ceiling. They they weren't worried about actually send. They would like send you. Oh, we sent out out to a couple of publishers, but we haven't heard anything back yet. You know, we'll, but we'll keep in touch. And they were just basically taking them all and throwing them into a shed. They never submitted a one, but people were paying them, you know, 25 bucks a month. Oh, $25 isn't that much, you know, to get representation. Well, it is when you've got, you know, several hundred people sending it in every month. And it took quite a while. And, you know, then they wound up, you know, getting to see what the inside of the Texas uh, state penitentiary looked like. And I was, we were very happy to uh, see them go under. Okay, so I'm going to take a look here at the chat real quick and see uh, what we've got. See what we've got going on here. Um, 
Okay, no questions yet. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and stop here for um, uh, for any questions you all may have about agents. So either in chat or if uh, um, if we want, I don't know if we how we can let them. You know, if they if you want to unmute and just ask that, that's fine too. Yeah, if anyone wants to ask a question out loud, um, if you want to do the raise hand feature, we can uh, let you speak as well. Okay, Karen. Oh, Karen, it's not letting me. We have an older version of Zoom. Uh, give us just one minute, we'll get you up here. Oh, how to find a nonfiction agent. All okay, right. okay. while you're working with Karen, I'll, I'll try to answer we've this got, one. We've got Karen up. Oh, we got Karen? Okay, go ahead, Karen. But she's on mute. We'll then we'll get, okay. Can we unmute her? Can you hear me now? Gotcha. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, you mentioned a couple of times the importance of uh, the right subject matter going to the right editors. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in children's books, and I just want to throw that out there in case it's not something you're going to talk about that you might say something when it's appropriate. That's my question. Um, well, like I said, the um, agents will usually have a list what they call their uh, their uh, they'll they'll like post like wish lists or something usually on their on their site and they'll say I represent you know middle age or I mean middle grade or I represent young adult or I represent adult say mm -hmm. science fiction mm -hmm. um, so it again it's just it, you know you'll probably a lot of times you find agents you'll go to like the agency page and then they'll list like they'll have like a link to all of the different agents who work for the agency and normally they have it's something posted there saying what they do and don't represent which actually will actually get to Anna's question here too about finding a nonfiction agent um there are um like i said they're like i said they should have it listed in there like they're looking for memoirs they're looking for you know uh you know historical i mean his, histories uh they may focus in military you know like say a military history thing uh as opposed to mil as opposed to historical fiction uh, I see. Oh, some some of the historians actually represent uh uh historical fiction too because you know they they're familiar with the with the era um, again, it, a lot of, like I said, this is where a, an, a good agency with a good website will, will get a lot of attention because they make it very clear. I represent this. I don't represent. The, and the, a lot of them will specifically say, I do not represent this. Please don't send this to me because okay. again, it just wastes a lot of their time and it winds up wasting your time sending stuff that's inappropriate. Okay. Thank did that, you. Did that sort of answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Okay. And I hope that answered Anna's question also. So we have any others before we press on? All right, not seeing any hands. So we're going to go ahead and move on here. And then if you have any other questions, you know, like I said, uh, we'll, we'll definitely try and get some here at the end. So. And again, what we say, what we like to say is if an agent brings up any of those points, we just, you know, any of those red flags, run, do not walk to the nearest exit because they do not have your best intentions in mind. Now, publishers, publishers, again, if you're going, if you're thinking about going, you know, into trade publishing, we like, we like to look at them as you have your commercial, which is like your big five. Uh, your Simon and Schuster's, your Hachette's, uh, your Random Penguin, uh, or you know some of the some of the mid there's some midsize uh, publishers, and you know even you know, that are you know very reputable, uh, and uh, of course a lot of them are getting bought up by the big five, but you know they're still out there. Again, but there are books you're going to find like if you go to like if you do just walk down to Barnes and Noble and look at all the different publishers that are there, you know. Why are they good? They're in the Barnes and Noble. You know that they have published a book and it's in the bookstore. Therefore, you know, they're generally, generally a, you know, a, a place, you know, and again, as, as one of my friends said, always start at the top, 
and then work your way down. Don't start at the bottom, you know, don't immediately go to a small press. If you think, you know, I mean, I, I, what was it? Somebody don't self-censor yourself, start big and then work your way down. If, you know, if, if everybody rejects it at one level, then you go down to the next level, but you don't stop or, you know, or you don't automatically assume they're going to reject it. And then, and, you know, and short change yourself. Uh, the next level are like your university presses, your regional presses, or maybe a specialty press. There's a press, uh, I, I don't remember the name, I just went blank, but they specialize in ghost stories. They publish books all around the country, but they're only sold regionally, like they did like the Ghost of the Great Lakes, or they did the Ghost of the Chesapeake, or they did the Ghost of, you know, North Carolina. And, you know, they focus on like, you know, maybe pirate ghost stories or et cetera. That's a great press. But again, that's not something that's necessarily going to be sold nationwide. They don't need to be as big as a Hachette. But you can still get great sales because you see these books all the time. Anytime you go you know, into a touristy place, uh, university presses, if I need to get a book on the Civil War, the first place I want to look is the Louisiana State University Press. Louisiana State has some of the best Civil War authors that work for them. And they're researched. They're, it's a university press. They're not going to put out a nonfiction book that hasn't been properly annotated. That, you know, trust me, they, they are going to, you know, you talk about footnotes. They're going to be there because that's what universities do. I don't know how many of you all suffered through Composition 101 like I did. But, you know, they're just, as, they're just as picky on their press as they are in the classroom. And again, regional presses, you know, there are several that suffer you now that promote, you know, Southern Gothic. I mean, sure, it might be bought somewhere else around the country, but you know, it sells well down in the Southeast. Um, you know, uh, Western Tales, again, they, you know, there are some presses out in New Mexico and Arizona that specialize still in a lot of Westerns. And, you know, they may not sell as well on the East Coast, but they're not aiming at the East Coast sales. They're aiming for, you know, their region. Again, very reputable. Don't pay as well as the big presses do, but that's because they don't make as much. You won't, you know, again, you're not making as much money. You're not having the kind of sales, but you will get sales and you will make money. Now, small presses and e-publishers can be very good because, there are, you know, these tend to be niche publishers. Uh, one publisher I work with, um, again, I don't make a ton of money off of them, but I do make money. Uh, it specializes in what they call new pulp. It's sort of like going that whole 1940s, 50s uh, pulp uh, adventure stories, hard-boiled detectives, uh, adventurers, you know, uh, and again, they wind up licensing a bunch of stuff that maybe like old TV shows that are out of, that are out, you know, uh, not a big demand for them, but th the pulp community is pretty tight and they tend to support each other real well. So again, if I want to write in some of those things, it just makes sense to go to somebody who's specializing in stuff like that. And there are some presses that only release eBooks. Um, I'm, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm still old fashioned. I like having a book in my hand, but you know, if, if it is a way to get your story out, if they happen to publish stuff that you're interested in and you think, you know, it would be, it would look good for you to have this, you know, on, in, you know, in your portfolio, there's certainly nothing wrong with an e-publisher. Uh, again, always check, again, always check your contracts, whether it's a commercial press or a small press, one thing you always want to ensure is that there is what's called the right of revision. What that means is that either after so much time, maybe two years, maybe seven years, the book then reverts back to you and you now have the right to either take it to another publisher or publish it yourself or, you know, or they can renegotiate and then, you know, you can say, okay, fine. We've had pretty good sales 
I'll let you keep it for another three or five years, what, you know, whatever, you know, however it works out. Now, larger presses like say uh, your Simon & Schuster may once called, they will actually ask for the rights for the life of copyright, which currently is 70 years after you pass away. So it's your life plus 70 years. However, they should include something like if during this period, your book falls below X number of sales for say three years, the rights then revert to you. Why? One, it's not profitable for them to keep it. And two, you know, obviously, I mean, they've sold all they can. You might as well get your rights back so that you can then maybe, you know, self pub, you could, um, you know, maybe go to a different press with it. But again, it's, it's a way that you I mean, so I know it's scary when you say right of copyright, but as long as there's a good revision clause in there, you know, after X time or after X amount of sales, then, you know, that's perfectly fine. It's the ones that are just open-ended. If they don't, if the contract doesn't have anything in it at all about right of revision, you either need to write that back, write it in and basically say, hey, here's what I'm willing to give you. Or you need to just walk away because if they won't even negotiate that, that's not a press I would want to be associated with. And self-publishing again is used to be 20 years ago, self-publishing might have fallen below the line that you're seeing there. But obviously, as we all know, self-publishing or independent publishing has become, you know, completely acceptable and um, is very useful. Again, I'll get more into I'll get more into self-publishing here in just a moment. But you'll note there is a cut line, and then there are three types of presses that are below the cut line that you want to avoid. We have vanity presses, your reverse vanity press, which while it sounds contradictory, is actually more dangerous. And then you're out and out scammers. A vanity press is basically a printer. You hand them a manuscript, they print the manuscript, they send it back to you. Or, you know, they, they, you know, they slap a cover on it and they ship it out. Uh, if it's a good vanity press, it doesn't put their name on it. it uh, if it's a bad vanity press, they actually will put their name, they'll, they'll actually claim that you published under them. Um, again, and this can be good for a specialized thing. Like I wrote the history for my church years ago. It was our it was the church's hundredth anniversary. Honestly, nobody who's not a member of the church could care. So we went to this place, said, "Hey, how much would it cost to get a hundred copies made?" They told us. You know, we we had the book edited, we got it printed. You know. Um, we, you know, I think we gave it away to everybody in the church that wanted a copy, and then er they go back every so often and maybe uh, print up another 20 copies for new people. Uh, they probably will want to do a revision here. I think we're actually getting ready to come up on, well, they'll be doing the 150th in about 10 years. Um, and, you know, it was, you know, but it's, again, it's a very limited thing. You want to do a your family history, you want to write your memoir just so your grandkids have a copy of, you know, what things were like when you, when you were young. Um, again, you're going to sell, you're, even, you're not going to sell, you're going to give away like eight, 12 copies. Again, no big press is going to be interested, but a vanity press is perfect because you're using them as a printer. Or we put down here, uh, people have a built-in audience, uh, people who do things like those financial talks. You know, where they, they'll be like it down at the Holiday Inn and, you know, everybody come down and talk. You know, he's going to be doing a talk on real estate. Well, he'll order like 25 copies of his book because he knows that's about how much he sells in a night. He'll have them in the back of the room after he gets some of the talk. He'll tell everybody his book is there. You can go back and buy them. He may wind up giving two or three of them away because if the leftovers to whoever his host was, he'll call up and say, hey, I'm going to be in Chattanooga in three nights. Can you drop ship me 25 more? When he gets to the hotel, there's 25 books waiting for him, and then he'll have 25 more waiting in Houston when he goes there next. Again, he know he doesn't want to haul books with him because you know airlines are horrible at with books, and 
again, it, it, he's got a built-in, he knows he's going to make X number of sales. There's really no point in doing a 5,000 copy print run. And so he just does some print on demand and goes from there. Perfectly legitimate reason to use a vanity press. But vanity presses are usually horrible for fiction. Again, you can't get them into bookstores outside of maybe if the bookstore has a local author shelf where they will take, you know, again, print on demand books, because usually the, 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 the discount you can give the bookstore is not anything that the bookstore really is interested in. So they'll probably take it on a commission basis or a consignment basis. Again, they don't do any editing or very little. A lot of times they might run spell check. And uh, a lot of them, uh, the vanity presses charge you more for a book than you're reasonably going to recoup in sales. So, you know, so if you're thinking about, you know, using a vanity press to, you know, to, to do your, you know, to, you know, as a way to get published, I highly recommend against it because the odds are you're just not going to make good enough sales. And what you do make isn't going to, is barely going to cover your printing costs. But then you have the reverse vanity press. These are evil people because they don't claim to be a vanity press. As a matter of fact, they will not ask you for any money up front. What they're counting on is the fact that we authors love our books and we want to have copies of our books. We want to be able to give them out to friends. We want to be able to maybe sell them at a show or, you know, tap, you know, to, you know, if nothing else, our I love me wall. Um, so they advertise themselves as being an, a traditional publisher. They might even give you a small advance. And I'm by being small. One of the worst ones we had is luckily now out of business. It was called Publish America. Publish America used to give you a $1 advance on your book. I think it cost them more to send you the dollar than, you know, <laughs> I mean, it was ridiculous, but they were, again, they wouldn't do any editing or what they would do was basically they were hiring kids from one of the local junior colleges here in Maryland who would basically, their whole job was to run spell check and then run grammatic. And that was it because they had to get X number of books done a day. Most editors, it, even the really good editors take several days to go through a book to edit it. These people had X number of books to do a day, which tells you they had no time to actually do any real editing. If you got spell checked, you were lucky. The worst thing that happened with Publish America is there was an author that I know. He had found his grandfather's diary from the invasion of Iwo Jima. And he had actually then gone back and talked to his grandfather and interviewed him. So the book kind of went, it was part of it, you know, it was partly him reminiscing with his grandfather 40 years after the war and, you know, from, you know, when his grandfather was an 18 year old on Okinawa. Publish America bought the book because why? Because he went to the, went to Google. He saw a publisher. They were the number one publisher in America, according to them. So he sent them their book and he immediately got a contract. And then he went out and was like sending out copies of his manuscript you know he, he me his rough he was sending out like two or three a little two or three chapter thing and he wound up getting pre-orders of 60,000 copies mainly from the american legion and the veterans of foreign wars who wanted to put this book in every chapter they had because the story was that good and then he got his copies from his publisher did you know there's a town called Autoimmune in Okinawa? What they had done is gone through and hit spell check, accept all, done. And they changed every Japanese town, every Japanese name, anything to do with anything that wasn't your standard English word. They just said, sure, whatever the next, yeah, that's good enough. And then they wouldn't change it why 
they weren't set up to do a 60,000 book run. They were set up to print on, they had their own printer. They were doing this print on demand, only they were doing it literally in their own office. They were printing people's books. So if they had to print more than a hundred books at a time, they pretty much were out of all of their supplies. He wound up having to cancel all those orders because the publisher wouldn't change and make the corrections on his book. Oh, and his book was tied up for seven years and they would not renegotiate letting him out of that contract. As far as I know, he has never published another thing. again. Mac, I know he just quit. He's like, well, if this is publishing, I'm done. And he walked away. And what would have been a beautiful story, a true homage to his grandfather got taken away from him because of an unscrupulous publisher. So, and I mean, so again, this is why, I'm, why you had to watch out what, it, and you know, you had to, like I said, you've got to read the contract, but you really need to, if you don't have an agent, you need to at least have an IP lawyer an, an intellectual property lawyer, look it over because words matter. And a contract again is not there for when things are going right. A contract is there for when things hit the fan. And the way the Publish America contract was written, it was all Publish America, you know, author zero. And what they do, though, is see, they pop, they, uh, and I'll, I'll refer back to Publish America again. They would print books as small as 24 pages, which really isn't a book, it's a pamphlet, but they would print books as small as 24 pages and then charge like 10 bucks a piece for them. Or if you had written an actual novel, typical novel size, it would be, they would charge $39.95 to $55.99. Why? They didn't want to sell the book to the public. They wanted to sell the book to you. Because what they will do is they, the second you're within, or within a week after your book is quote unquote published, they will start hitting you up with emails. Hey, this week for, if you'll buy 50 copies of your book, we'll sell you then we'll sell you another 50 for, you know, 75% off cover price. So you would have to buy 50 books at this ridiculous price to get another 50 books at a semi-reasonable price. And what they weren't telling you is none of these books that you were buying counted against your royalties. They didn't owe you royalties on any of those books because those were author purchases and that was their that was their way of making money they sold your book back to you over and over oh we're thinking about we're trying to get some books into see oprah if so if you'll buy 25 copies of your book we'll make sure your book is on the list we're sending to oprah or if you'll buy 100 copies of your book we're going to the london book fair which they never did and we'll take be sure and take your books with us it was just constantly email after email after email, buy your own book because we're your publisher. They weren't trying to get them into bookstores. And if they did, when they did offer to put them in bookstores, they were offering Barnes and Noble a 5% discount. Barnes and Noble charges more than that for a restocking fee. They couldn't pay somebody at minimum wage enough money I mean, that, I mean, the 5% they were getting off these books didn't even pay the person to put your book on the shelf. And again, there were no upfront fees. There were, you know, there was everything in their thing that said, you know, we get, you know, we're all about the authors. We pay our authors. Except they really didn't because they made all their money off their authors. And they tend to be an author farm. I think when Publish America finally went belly up about five years ago, they had over a hundred thousand authors there is no way in god's green earth that they were putting their attention on a hundred thousand authors now mind you they what they didn't tell you is how many people left the company every year because they just kept a running total of how many happy authors that they had assigned to them but again it was just uh it was a nightmare we fought them for years before they finally self-destructed and then scammers. And it's, it's hard to believe that there's actually worse people than that, but there really are. 
because you'll see things like they, they, they will need to have a setup fee. Uh, they're going to pressure you to buy your own book, just like Publish America did. Uh, they may have a pre-purchase requirement written into the contract where they will, you know, be happy to, you know, print your book as long as you guarantee to buy a hundred copies up front. Or they may have a pre-sale where you have to guarantee that you have, that there will be 100 pre-orders on Amazon before they will go to press. And they're going to use terms like subsidy, co-op, joint venture, partner, or the new one, and I'm going to fall on, I'm, I'm, I swear I'm going to die on this hill because I know everybody and their uncle disagrees with me, but I'm going to die on this hill anyway. Hybrid publishers. Folks, you can be a hybrid author. A hybrid author is somebody who's been trade published and independently published or self-pubbed. That's perfectly legit. A lot of publish, a lot of people have books that are on the you know, came out 20 years ago or so. They're not really selling. They've got the rights back. They re-release them as an independent. That's a hybrid author. A hybrid publisher is basically saying, hey, look, you spend X amount of money and I'll spend X amount of money and we'll meet in the middle and, and we'll put on a show. No, no. Tate Publishing, another one that's out of business, thank God, and uh, was a Christian bookseller in Oklahoma. They were asking $4,000 up front from their authors, and then they were going to match it with $4,000 of their work, and you know they were going to publish the books. I have worked with small presses. I have, I'm semi-self-published. I do, I do, I, I put the book together, and then I have a friend of mine who published, who, who, who already has a publishing company, and he prints my books for me. I know it doesn't cost $4,000 to publish a book. And that's with original art. That's not using, you know, free to use art. And that's, you know, paying for a editor and stuff. It does not cost $4,000. If a publisher, if a hybrid publisher comes to you and say, if you'll put up X amount of dollars and we'll put up X amount of dollars, I guarantee they have covered the price of the book plus their profit out of the $4,000, $3,000, whatever they're asking you to pay up front. They're not matching anything. That is a scam. And so, you know, please, if someone says they're a hybrid publisher, run away from them. They do not have your best interest at heart. So before I go on to self-publishing, I'll take uh, see if we got some questions here now about publishers. Now that I've uh, you know beaten up most of them pretty badly. Yeah, we had a couple in the chat here. Okay, let's see what we got. Um, go. Okay, uh, ebook publishers might support printing. Uh, right, uh, the ebook publishers. Uh, some of them can are. Some of them are okay if you uh, publish uh, self. I mean, if you if you go ahead and independently uh, do a print run on your books. Uh, again, it depends on what's in the contract. You've got to read it, and you know, you may need to negotiate with them. Some of them uh, have been known to they want to hold on to the pub, the print rights even though they don't plan on using them right now. Um, so it, it's it's definitely something you know it can happen. Uh, especially I'm, I'm not as familiar with the KDP program. I, I, I don't go, I'm not Amazon only. So uh, I don't, I haven't read a lot of their stuff, a lot of their rules, but again, it's, it, 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 it's going to come down to what's in your contract, whether you can, whether you can do that or not. Uh, let's see. Uh, um, yeah. The, yeah. Some of the vanity presses released your book, their book, release the books under their, title like uh I, i'm making up a title if, if there's a real company i i swear i'm not trying to say bad things about it. i'm just gonna say oak tree press just making up a name it could it would probably go out with the oak tree press stamp on the spine that's how they advertise um i mean there are there are some that don't do that you can or, or they charge you extra to have your company's logo put on it as opposed to their logo um, 
And sometimes you'll see them on, uh, if you look at their listing on Amazon, you may see the, the Vanity Press's name as the publisher instead of the self-publisher. Um, again, because, and again, it makes sense again, if, if you're a person who's really uncomfortable with the whole schmeal, um, you know, you, you hire a vanity press to, to put out your book because I really don't want to have to learn layout. I really don't want to have to, you know, learn design. I'm a horrible artist. Um, you know, it's, it makes sense to, you know, I mean, to get somebody who knows what they're doing, but again, you're, just, you're going to have to pay for it. And you, uh, again, that, but again, that falls on, you know, under independent publishing more than, than commercial publishing because a commercial publisher should be paying you and they should be doing that and then taking their cut on the back end as the money comes in because that's how they pay for their editors and artists and things like that. Um, let's see, next question here was, oh, okay. Uh, when, okay, got that there. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, not hearing or seeing any, so we'll go ahead and, oh, okay, I see one more there. Sorry, go ahead, please. Maybe you should be able to unmute. Oh, I was trying to do a chat. Oh, okay. is, um, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, if we have further questions, um, what's the best, is it possible to, what, what, what resources would you suggest? The websites that you have listed on your slides? Uh, it, yes, it, yeah, it should be the, 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 last, the last slide we get to will, will, has our contact information on it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and talk just about self-pubbing. Um, self-pubbing, you have to understand there is a difference between being a writer and a publisher. And I know self-publishing merges this together and it gets all kind of murky at times, but you really need to be able to separate in your brain. This is my publishing responsibilities and these are my writing responsibilities. So we're, I'm going to talk to you all as self-publishers, not self-writers right now. Uh, again, you need to be able to balance your time between publishing and writing. How much time am I going to spend writing? How much time am I going to spend, you know, putting the books together, doing the publicity, you know, uh, going to shows, you know, because you have to be your entire sale, your, your own sales force, as well as, um, you know, being a writer, because you honestly, you can't just take the book and throw it up on Amazon. It will be there with the other 8,000 that are going to go up today. And how do you make yourself stand out amongst, you know, all the other people? So you need to try and figure out, am I good at this? Am I not? As, you, as you'll see, you know, down here in the last one, you need to be honest with yourself. Are you good at certain things? Then, you know, by all means, do them. Save yourself some money. Am I not good at things? I am not an artist. Unless you really want to see book covers with stick figures, I should not be ever drawing a book cover. I will hire an artist or I will find uh, my publisher will occasionally find, you know, good free art that's available, you know, and, or, you know, we will, you know, you know try to deal with somebody, you know, because I know some art authors or some artists do non-commercial stuff. And then you have to contact them because you had to pay them a certain amount if you're going to use it commercially. Um, balance, again, balancing your time, knowing what you're good at, Understand how to separate. You should be paying your writer self some money. If you're taking all of the money that's coming in from your self-publishing and turning it right around and putting it right back in the company, why are you doing this? Honestly, you can put it up on the internet if you're just if you're if you're just going to give it away for free. You should be making some money on this as the writer. Uh, you know, just, just set it up in a separate account, you know, pay yourself a certain amount for every book, 
use that money, you know, buy, you know, uh, t- you know, take yourself out, you know, on a, you know, some nice dinners or, you know, you put money down towards that new dishwasher or whatever, but every time you sell a book, you should be putting money in the co- publisher's account and in the writer account. Because again, otherwise you can just put it on the internet for free and not worry about it. And it'd be a lot cheaper to do. Uh, find mentors who are successful. If you find somebody who's got, who's self-pubbing and doing well, and they're willing to work with you. And most authors are, you know, pretty, pretty, you know, giving people, uh, you know, if they're willing to give you a hand, take it. Now, beware of some of the self-publishing gurus. I'm not going to name names, but honestly, if I'm a New York Times bestseller and I've been working in the industry for 20 years, and then all of a sudden I decide to start self-pubbing, and then start telling everybody else, oh, you should only self-pub. Don't go through these big companies where I made my name. I'm a little suspicious of them. You know, people, there's, there's no reason not to go to a big publisher if you can. There's no reason not to self-publish if you can. What I'm saying, though, is people who are push one extreme or the other, I'm always wondering what's in it for them. Why are they... So, you know, that you should only self-pub or that you should only be commercially pub. No, there's room for all of them. So kind of, you know, if if someone's being a little too rah-rah about something, I would want to know why. And again, again, not saying that they're bad people, not saying they have bad intents, but I'm just, I'm just not comfortable with anybody who, who is one or the other and, and won't consider a, a median somewhere. Also, uh, you need to know when to spend money and when to do it yourself. Again, if I, uh, again, for me to do stuff, I would really need to, like, I'd have to have, probably have an InDesign account, which means I'm paying, you know, Adobe of, you know, a monthly fee or whatever. Uh, I really know I should never do a cover because I am not an artist. I'm okay as an editor. But editing yourself is tough. You really need somebody else to look it over. So if you don't at least have a really, really good beta reader, spending the money on an ed- on an editor is not necessarily a bad thing. However, always check the editors. There's a lot of people out there who, like I said, you can call yourself an agent. You can call yourself an editor. And they charge all kinds of amounts. And you really don't know what their qualifications are. Oh, if you're going to work with an editor, ask for a list of some of their clients, see if they've got some sample work that they've done that you can see. Uh, You might be able to ask, you know, you might be able to get them to do an edit or rough edit. They're not going to do a full edit, but they might do a rough edit of like a chapter of yours. Now, editors are, of course, very nervous about this, too, because they've had people who have like gone to one editor and gotten a chapter done, and then they send a different chapter to a different editor and so on. And they wind up trying to get their book edited for free. Uh, This, of course, grumps the heck out of editors because they don't want to be taken advantage of any more than you do. Uh, But, you know, a reasonable, you know, ask, you know, maybe they'll do a 10 page edit, a three page edit, you know, whatever you can negotiate. But, you know, not every editor is for every person. You need to just like it. Not every agent is for every person. You need to find somebody who, you know, has the same ideas, the same feel for the, and also is familiar with the genre. It absolutely does no good. And I've, 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 I've tried this with somebody else and it, it did not go well. Uh, I write sci-fi fantasy for the most part. This person wanted, you know, they were, they were trying to get their editing things started. So I let them, you know, work on one of my things. They're a romance author who's now doing editing. So they know what the romance genre needs, but it's slightly different. <laughs> the tr- I mean, sure, the, the grammar and everything was fine. They did a great job on grammar and spelling and stuff like that, but they couldn't really tell me whether the scene was working or not because, again, different tropes, different you know, requirements. It, it, just, it just did not go well. I still paid them for what they did because they had done a, a legitimate you know swipe at it 
but it was, you know, it was not a match made in heaven for us. Um, so again, know when you know when you have to spend money and then, you know, try to get, you know, uh, I'm always leery of people on Fiverr because again, that's where a lot of people who are amateurs. Now there's some legit people there. I'm not saying they're not, but again, that's why you got to get the samples. You got to look at who their clients are because again, everybody thinks they can edit because they think, you know, I mean, editing isn't editing, just sending it through spell check. Um, and I say this as a technical writer slash editor, it, it, it's amazing when you actually go back to people and say, well, this red, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's not good. And here's what you got to do to fix it. And then they get their you know, hackles up because now you're messing with their work. Um, have a business plan, figure out how much money do I want to spend? If I'm going to, if I'm going to be a self-publisher, because you are going to have to spend some money, how much is reasonable? How, how do I know if I'm overspending, if I don't have at least an idea of what I'm willing to spend? It's really easy to throw a lot of money into something a little bit here, a little bit there. And all of a sudden you realize you've spent a lot of money and you're still in the middle of the project. Also, if it's not working, if you have self-pubbed seven, eight books and you're not making any sales at all, maybe you went to press too soon. Maybe you need to find a better editor. Maybe you need to get more feedback on your stuff, but don't put out that ninth book while you're trying to figure out why the first eight didn't sell. Maybe take a break, stop, retool, relook. Maybe, you know, maybe those first eight books shouldn't have come. Because honestly, the worst thing you can do is, oh, this book got rejected by 14 agents and three publishers. I'll just self-publish it. No. There's probably a reason it was rejected by all those people. It, and it may just be some minor tweaking. Now, though, generally, if it's minor tweaking, they would have taken the book and then worked with you to fix it. It may just mean that that book wasn't the one you should have gone to press with. Maybe the ninth book, because sometimes you, you hit it on your first book. Sometimes you had to write three or four books before you really find your voice. So don't use self-pubbing as just a crutch. To, oh, well, if I couldn't sell it, you know, to a big publisher, I'll just put it out myself. That's the worst way to go. Uh, and also, you know, so maybe walk away, go back, really look at what you're doing, and then, and then come back and see if, you know, maybe I want to do this again. And don't throw good money after bad. If, you, if you've spent a ton of money and you're getting nowhere, again, stop. Re Reevaluate, relook at and, you know, uh, but don't just keep throwing more money. Don't spend tons of money on if on uh, Facebook ads or Twitter ads or whatever. Again, if you're unless you've already figured that into your business plan. But if you're doing that and you're getting no kicks, you're getting no clicks. Maybe Twitter ads ain't where you need to be. Maybe you need to look at, you know, doing an Amazon ad or something. I mean, but you need to have a plan so that you know where am i spending my money and how much money am i spending it on I'm, I'm keep going back to that because it's really easy to throw away a lot of money i know i did i i was in self-publishing back in and doing comic books back in the 90s during the great black and white explosion except i managed to time out the black and white implosion when the market went to heck and i wound up spending a crap ton of money uh, well, I thought it was a pretty good book, but it just, the market was going away. I hadn't done the research to see what the trends were. And I, I wound up investing a lot of money uh, on a lot of books that I'm still have down in my basement. It happens. You know, you got to know when, but we finally pulled the plug and said, okay, look, we, we, we've wasted, we spent a lot of money. We're not getting our money back. There's no point in, you know, in, in uh, going further into debt uh, over this. So um, we, you know, again, I had to, I had to close the company. It happens. No shame in it. You gave it a shot. It wasn't meant to be. And I'm going to point out here, remember, highly successful authors in self-publishing are notable because they're rare. The people who self-pub and then you know wind up selling a hundred thousand copies or the people who self-pub and then get picked up by a major company 
and get movies made about their books and stuff like that. We all talk about them. I mean, that's cool. But again, it's cool because it doesn't happen very often. I guarantee there are, for every one person like that, there's probably a couple of hundred authors who don't get picked up by a bigger company or, you know, I mean, have good steady sales, but they're not going to be the people that the, the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times is writing about the next cool thing that came out of, out of small presses. Um, you know, it, it's, it's just the nature of, of life, though, but we upset, we focus on the success stories, you know, just like the, the waiter who goes out to Hollywood and gets, you know, seen. Well, you know, how many waiters are out in Hollywood? And all of them are aspiring actors. But, you know, most of them are still aspiring when they retire. So some of the bewares, there is an entire market out there of people selling self-publishing services. They'll be selling editing. They'll be selling printing. They'll be selling uh, publicity. They'll be selling uh, radio interviews, uh, book interviews, um, Pretty much anything associated with publishing, they will try to sell a self-publisher. And it starts the day you read, the day you file your copyright for your self-published book, they will start mailing you. If you look at the uh, Writer Beware blog, Victoria has a list of about 70 companies in the Philippines alone that are constantly writing, calling. They're cold calling people uh, because they have your contact information from the uh, your registration at the Library of Congress. And they will find you and they will try to convince you that you need to uh, hire them to do X, Y, or Z. And, and it's part of a package that they're selling. Oh, we can do this and this and this and this and this for you. But for the small price of, and it's usually not a small price, we're talking anywhere from 700 to $7,000 they're asking for. Uh, I already mentioned hybrid publishers. I won't beat, I won't beat that drum again. Yeah, I've got enough holes in my stomach from falling on my sword. Um, editors, again, check them out. What have they worked on? Are, you know, and uh, what are their prices? I mean, you know, you, you definitely need to know up front. Are they charging by the hour? Are they charging by the page? Are they charging by the word? Everyone's got their own different way of doing it. And it really makes it hard to, to be able to compare one to the other when everybody you know is charging different rates. Publicists, again, you know, they'll offer to get you, you know, we got to watch it. Like people are like, oh, we can do this. And what they're doing is they're like doing mass spam emails. Uh, they'll try to get you to like uh, book trailers. I, I mean, I can't say I have ever bought a book based on a, a, a 30 second trailer or a minute trailer put up on Facebook, maybe people do, it might work. I'm not willing to pay money to find out. Um, you know, so again, people are gonna uh, make you, especially listen to what they're, I mean, really take yourself back, never agree to anything up front. take yourself back and really look at what they're saying because they will promise you the moon and the stars as long as, as long as you're willing to go reach for that credit card number. Reviewers who ask for money for reviews. Can't do it. Nope, because I don't trust the review. Because once word gets out, because, you know, and you say, well, how would people know? Well, they find people talk. Other authors will, will run into these reviewers. And especially, like Kirkus, honestly, Kirkus, just annoys me because a Kirkus star is something special, but they also have a Kirkus review that you can pay for. I have yet to see a Kirkus paid review that basically said this book stunk. Why? They want people to buy the they want people to buy the reviews. So, you know, I don't trust paid reviews because I can't believe they're honest because. Nobody want, nobody's going to give their book to a reviewer if they know it's going to get ripped apart. And I'm sure not paying for somebody to give me a one star. So they don't give one stars. They give fours and fives. Maybe and fours really as low as I've ever seen. Why? They want people to come back and buy more reviews. You know, 
and it looks good until if people find out that people have been, that these people have been you know giving out you know paid reviews and then a lot of places you know remove the reviews so you now you've paid for a few that nobody can see always ask yourself what's in it for them when people approach you about helping you out with your book so let's go ahead and check out the chat i want to check the chat here for uh is there a magical sales figure um for self-publishing that would attract a traditional publisher self-publishing is not the way to get well okay self-publishing is a really bad way to get into publishing if you're wanting a commercial career uh honestly a self-pub book would probably have to sell 50 60 000 copies um Maybe if less these days, but that was generally the, the word I heard. And of course, you can't sell that book to a commercial publisher. Why? Because if you've sold enough books to get their attention, you've probably saturated your market. Now, that might help you. But if you can go to a publisher and say, hey, but my last book sold this much. And so that's why I would like you to look at this new one I've got. Okay, it can, it can be done. But it, once you publish... As a self-pub book, the odds are nobody's going to nobody's going to pick that book up again uh, and and publish it because everybody wants the first rights. They want they want to be, you know, th they want the first chomp on the apple, not the core. Um, but I mean, I forget. Um, you know, I it's it's going to be well into the tens of thousands that you're going to need to have sold to to really be able to go to a publisher and say and see this is these were my sales therefore you should consider picking me up um i'm not saying to i'm not saying to hide it from them i don't i i'm still honestly i'm still looking for an agent i started out doing media tie-in first before i started doing uh original work and as i tell people i just haven't written anything that's caught an agent's attention yet doesn't mean they're bad stories, just maybe not the right story at the right time. It doesn't mean I'm going to quit. I'm still, you know, trying to get an agent. And when I do send my stuff off to an agent, I do mention my credits as both independent and, you know, my media tie and stuff. But honestly, the agent really only cares about the book you're sending them right now. You can have 100 credits. You can have zero credits. The thing that gets you the agent, the thing that gets you the publisher is the current book that you're submitting. Uh, let's see. Uh, questionable publishers are pursuing self-published authors. Often huge sales on sign up for. Re re oh, that is a hor That's another horrible scam. They got one company that basically is saying, "You've already self-published, but we need you to self-publish through. We need you to publish through this company to make it cleaner, neater, better, brighter, so that then we can turn around and try and sell it to Simon and Schuster." Simon & Schuster isn't going to buy a third copy, you know, a third printing. They want a first printing. Again, like I said, if it's already been published, it's almost impossible to get to sell it. Not, I say almost. There's always an exception. The trouble is people latch onto the exceptions as if they're the rule. They're not. You know, publishers are looking for that first printing right, that first press run. Uh, so you're right. There are a lot of questionable people who are uh, pushing it. It's really being pushed by a lot by these Filipino companies. Again, I don't mean to pick on the Philippines. It's a wonderful country. But what happened was one of these vanity presses called Author Solutions used to be work, used to be out of Ohio. They farmed all their stuff out to the Philippines because it was they could pay those people pennies on the dollar what they were paying people in Ohio to do the same job and taught them all the things about how to get people you know to sign people for vanity presses and sign them up for you know publishing and editing and you know uh, publicity and websites and stuff like that and then um when author solutions went under all these people were like hey well we already learned all this stuff and we know americans will buy this stuff so we'll just keep doing it and they just created their own companies and kept going so it's uh it's it has become quite the scourge here lately i mean man victoria spends 
half of her time just tracking down who, you know, what these companies have changed their name to. So since we're getting close to the end here, and I do want to try and leave a little bit of time for uh, questions, if we have any more, I just want to point out, you know, when in doubt, remember Yogg's Law, which is money flows to the author or Crispin's Colliery, which is the only place an author signs a check is on the back. So useful websites. I, I highly, again, we have the writerbeware.com is uh, our website. We've got a lot of good information there. A lot of ca uh, former cases, you know, experiences we've had with publishers, editors, agents, et cetera, et cetera. The Writer Beware blog is at writerbeware.blog. Uh, that's a new. That's a, the new uh, bookmark. If you if you had the old one before, uh, this is the new uh, URL. And then one thing I recommend. Uh, it's not always for the faint of heart, but there's a writers group called Absolute Absolute Right. Uh, they have a forum. Uh, it can be a little testy because some of the people have been there for about twenty. 20 years and you know they sometimes people just pop in and ask questions that you know somebody has like asked three weeks before and the usual first response is did you check the index you know did you you know did you you know check to see if anybody had already asked this question because honestly there have been a lot of questions asked but the bewares recommendations and background checks part of the forum i highly recommend because in the index we have a list of every I won't say every, all of the publishers, agents, editors, publicists, et cetera, et cetera, that have been, that we know of, and they're usually listed prime, they're, they're either an active file or they've been grayed out. If they've been grayed out, that means they're no longer in business. Folks, take a look at some of the small publishers, that list of publishers, because there are a lot of grayed out ones. And the trouble is when those grayed out, when, when those publishers went out of business, a lot of times they took their authors with them because they didn't give rights of revision back or rights of reversion back to their people, which means none of their books are free and clear, which means they can't get them published anywhere else because they don't technically own the rights, even though the company went bankrupt. If they didn't revert the rights, the rights still belong to the company. And uh, that's a really, that's a really bad situation to be in because that company will never come back, but they won't give you your rights back. And now you're basically just lost that book and you have to go on and, you know, do something else, which hopefully you've already started. As soon as your first book came out, you you started writing your second book. Actually, you started writing your second book as soon as you started trying to get an agent or starting to ship around the first one, because you always want to be writing that next book. So uh, let's see if we have any more questions before we have, before uh, they have to kick me off here. Or uh, let's see, uh, let's, I see someone's raised their hand here. Go ahead, please. Uh, should be on. Should be. Oh, did you hear now. me? No, no. Go ahead, please again. Yeah, uh, Absolute Right Water Cooler. Is that the website? Uh, the website is absoluteright.com slash forums. The forums is called the Water Cooler. Absoluteright.com slash forums. Yeah. And then inside the forums is the Beware Recommendations and Backgrounds Check, Background Checks. And like I said, I, if you're thinking about using, you know, getting a publisher, talking to a small press, or even if, and they have another section there for self-pubbing. Uh, so you can talk to people who have, and they can basically say, this went well, and this did not go well. And luckily, people are pretty good about saying, hey, I tried this, and it, it just did not work. So, um, you know, uh, I, I just want, I mean, I, I find most of the, most of the people on that pan, on that website are, are pretty accommodating to newbies. You have a few curmudgeons, but you're going to get that with any online community. Now, what do we got here? 
I had a question, Rich. Um, yes. What about, what about times on social media? Sometimes, uh, like on Twitter, you'll see people from different publishing agencies maybe calling for pitches or manuscripts. Can you kind of talk about that experience a little bit? Um, well, I do know they do things like, I mean, they they do have what's called like they have like rev pit and or dark pit or whether they have like pitching contests there are some legitimate agents involved in that and i have i do know of a couple of people who have actually gotten picked up through those things the trouble is with those is again they for the most part they don't vet who's uh who can like you know, because if, if you give it a like, that means please submit your uh, manuscript to me. And there are an awful lot of questionable agents who hang out on things like that and basically use it as, you know, instead of me having to call you, you're already saying, hey, come, you know, send me th something. So, um, you know, there, there are a lot of less than desirable agents who hang out there. there but there are some legitimate ones. Also, uh, Twitter, you know, like a Twitter or a Facebook or something, sometimes agents will post their, uh, their wish lists and uh, say, hey, you know, I've, I would really love to get something that's like, you know, uh, uh, middle grade fantasy with a, uh, you know, a specific type of character. And if you've got a story like that, fantastic. The trouble is, if you don't have a story like that, they'll probably have already gotten so many submissions by the time you write a story like that, it'll be too late. Uh, but it, you know, it's certainly worth getting an idea of, of maybe, you know, you can use that because a lot of agents are happy to tell you, hey, I, I really would love to get more of this because I've been getting a ton of this. But the uh, the online contests, um, again, I, I it's, it's a fairly, it's not a new phenomena, but it's, it's, like anything else, I mean, there's there the you you'll have three or four good agents who are doing it, and then you'll get a whole bunch of uh, strap hangers who will use that as as uh, trolling. Uh, yes, Aline uh, or Aline. Sorry, I'm no massacring your name. Uh, Go ahead, go ahead and unmute. Unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah, got you now. Yeah. Uh, you talked about art, uh, original art. What if uh, the original art, um, uh, in order to find the rights um, to be able to use it in one's own book, uh, I've encountered one situation where uh, the uh, company under which the book was first published was bought out by another company and bought out by yet another company and finally some company in England and it goes on and on and on into some dark <laughs> uh, distant place. Um, are, do you have any uh, advice or recommendations of how one can do searches like this? Uh, honestly, if, if, it, if, it's, if it's something like that, unless it's something that is so absolutely vital for you to get it, you would probably be better off fi maybe finding somebody who is on deviant art or you art station or something like that who might be willing to do a new cover in that in that kind of same vein if if their art style is somewhat close to that and that way you have something that's unique to you uh, art rights are kind of like music rights uh you know, some, some musicians are, if you write them and ask them, they're like, well, oh, you're going to use like a three lines out of my song. Sure. Go ahead. If it's tied up between like 14 different, cause you know how some songs have like 14 different authors assigned to them and two different music companies, BMI and ASCAP and yada, yada. And by the time everybody signs off on it, you're paying like $6,000 to use three lines of a song. Just make up your own song. No one will know. Or if you have to have that song, just say, I walked in and you know the and the band was playing such and such song. You can name the song. You just can't use any words from it. Same thing with, with art. If if you, if your art has been, you know, completely, I mean, because I was I was having to look up too. Um 
you know, who, you know, this media, media tie-in thing that I had worked on before, they went out of business and they got bought by this, who then got bought by that. And, you know, I actually wound up going to the library and the librarian did a search for me. So I'm going to pitch the librarians here. And because they knew, you know, where to go and, and what resources. And basically when it finally came back, all said and done, and it turned out that basically I would have to deal with Warner Brothers. And I went, I don't have that kind of money. So we won't even bother, you know, I'm not even going to bother trying to pursue that license because it's what they're going to ask for it is more than I would ever make on, you know, re-releasing that book. Uh, and again, in, in, in your art, what it sounds like with your art there, you would probably spend less getting an art, getting an artist uh, I, to make, I, to make I, a new copy. I'm, I'm writing, I'm, I'm writing a book about an artist. <laughs> so ah, it has to be ooh, art. Ooh. Ooh, yeah, that's a whole, that's a whole nother ball of wax and not something I can probably get into this evening. Uh, Any suggestions yeah, without... of, where, of where I might uh, go for uh, guidance on that? I would, well, one, you've got a good library right here. There's a, there's a good possibility the librarians would, would be able or could either uh, help you track it down or would probably know some people who could help you in you know, between them and the university uh, who could probably help you track down uh where stuff is that thank would be you. that would be my first that would be my first suggestion thank you especially once you said it's if it's over it's over in england now man it's that's going to take some digging thank you okay sorry i couldn't give you better better advice than that no i appreciate it thank you all right i think we're yeah. we're just about at the end of our evening here um, but thank you so much, Rich. And we've got um, people sharing in the chat their their thanks uh, to you, to Writer Beware, to Victoria for uh, for tonight and all of the overall guidance that you guys have provided. Uh, I know it's a really excellent resource for writers and, and anyone in that field. And one thing I don't have on the website was well, because it's not a website. But if you also have a question or a you know. You can, you, we, we won't necessarily tell you who's a good publisher because what's good for you may not be good for everybody. But if you want to say, hey, have you heard any complaints about somebody? You can reach out to Victoria at beware at sfwa.com. That's our, that's our email. And uh, all correspondence is kept in, in full confidentiality. Uh, if you've got a complaint about somebody, you can let us know. If you have a question about somebody, you can ask us and we'll get back to you as quick as we can. Awesome. Um, please do check out Right Everywhere if you haven't yet. Um, please check out Rich and his work. And um, we hope you'll join us for a local author day this weekend. Um, everyone should have received the slides for today's presentation. If you haven't, please feel free to reach out to me at the library. We'll be happy to connect you to those resources. And if you have any further questions, uh, a lot of our talk tonight was about research and we do enjoy some good research at the library. So please let us know if we can help. Um, but we'll say once again, Rich, thank you again so much for this very- Thank you all for inviting me. And uh, thanks everyone. We will say farewell. Night, Rich. Good night.